welcome to episode 3 of The Three Ravens Bestiary, a series all about mythical monsters, legendary creatures, and things that go bump in the night. My name's Martin Vaux, I'm a writer, storyteller, and English romanticism obsessive, and I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in crime and all dark arts, Eleanor Conlon. Hello! So, Martin, we're talking phoenixes. Yeah. I confess I don't know very much about them, aside from that they're birds associated with fire that yeah. come back to life after they die. And I'm very interested in learning more. Well then, you're in the right place. And there's no doubt that the Phoenix is a major icon in fantasy fiction and medieval art. But when you think about the Phoenix, what thoughts pop into mind? Honestly, I think about Harry Potter and <laughs> Fawkes, the lovely Phoenix. OK, now, dear listener, this is one rare area where Eleanor and I part ways, as you, Eleanor, are a staunch defender of the second Harry Potter book, The Chamber of Secrets, whereas... I'm a prisoner of Azkaban guy. I do like the Chamber of Secrets a lot. <laughs> I, I must say I'm usually a book two fan you, in a you fantasy like a book series. Two, I do enjoy a book two. <laughs> and uh, I remember in that book, Fawkes the Phoenix famously saves Harry's life with a teardrop when Harry's bitten by the basilisk. Yes, and that is a quality of the Phoenix, which was made up by J.K. Rowling, the old healing tears. Oh, really? Yeah, and at the risk of going off into a deep tangent here, and spoilers for Harry Potter, but okay, here we go. Just to hear me out. If Harry in the Deathly Hallows uses basilisk venom to destroy Horcruxes, and Harry himself is a Horcrux, as is revealed towards the end, as this big twist, why didn't the basilisk venom destroy the Horcrux in Harry way back in book two? This is neither the time or the place. I'm just but saying, I'm, I'm going to say antibiotics. Doesn't make sense. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're Doesn't... going to talk about phoenixes now, Martin. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm taking a breath in deep breath out and I'm trying my best to hold back my thoughts about Thestrals and Harry not seeing them even though he watched his parents die. Another time. Reel it in. Okay. All right. Well, there's various folklore attached to phoenixes, these mythical birds which kind of cohered over time. For example, by the Middle Ages, people had come to generally believe that only one phoenix existed at any given time and that it was very long lived. In fact, no ancient authority gives the phoenix a lifespan of less than 500 years. Wow, that's old. Yeah, and you'd imagine it would have quite creaky wings at that point. <laughs> anyway, it was also believed that when a phoenix approached the end of its life, it would make a nest, sometimes of the leaves of aromatic herbs and trees and spices. Then it would set its nest on fire, be consumed in the flames, and the ash would then cohere to form a new egg from which would hatch a new phoenix. So straight away this is very interesting as a form of birth because mm. there's no mummy and daddy phoenixes. No. So the, the phoenix is a kind of asexual solo creature. Yeah, precisely. In modern science we call this kind of reproduction parthenogenesis and it's known to happen in nature across various different species including certain amphibians, lizards, insects, fish and some birds such as domesticated chickens, turkeys and pigeons. Okay well I don't think we should bring the glorious <laughs> phoenix crashing down to earth and coop it up with chickens and turkeys. No probably not. <laughs> but where did the legend start? What's the earliest mention of a phoenix that we know about? Okay so the earliest known reference to a phoenix comes from the person we generally consider to be the first ever poet. I'm talking here of Hesiod, an ancient Greek who was writing roughly between 750 and 650 BC. Good old Hesiod. He was all right, wasn't he? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Hesiod. He's kind of the father of what we might call pastoral poetry, so poetry about the natural world, which in turn became lyric and then romantic poetry. And if you've never read any of Hesiod's work and days, I would heartily recommend it. It's a little bit sexist. Yeah. And there's a bit when he compares men and women to bees. Yes. With women staying at home in the hive, having a lovely time yeah. and relying on the hard work of the drone-like men. I mean, hey, I'm not saying he was a perfect guy, but... Unlike Homer, Hesiod's poetry is about nature and natural cycles and work and days is pretty interesting. It's kind of a set of poetic idioms or lessons, you might say, about how to live and work with the life of a farmer serving as a kind of extended metaphor for everyone's life. There's a lot less fighting and kissing in it than the Iliad or the Odyssey, though. <laughs> yeah, very and regrettably true. Um, still, one of Hesiod's lesser known poems, The Precepts of Chiron, survives only in a few fragments and this is where we get the very first mention of 
the phoenix. The poem in full was said to have been a conversation where the wise centaur, Chiron, offers advice to Achilles. And in case you aren't aware, it said that in Greek myth, the great hero Achilles was educated by Chiron, this wise centaur. Pretty great to have a centre as a teacher, I must say. I'm a little bit envious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Mr Gatchek in primary school was pretty awesome, but as far as I'm aware, he wasn't a centre, or if he was, he was hiding it very well. <laughs> well, in Hesiod's Precepts of Chiron, we have these little lines of advice, such as, decide no suit until you have heard both sides speak. And, famously, a chattering crow lives out nine generations of aged men. But a stag's life is four times a crow's, and a raven's life makes three stags old, while the phoenix outlives nine ravens. But the rich-haired nymphs, daughters of Zeus, the Aegis holder, outlive ten phoenixes. Well, firstly, that puts us ravens firmly in our place, but (laughs) it also sounds like a kind of riddle. Yeah, it does. And because we don't have any of the surrounding text, we really don't know what it's referring to. But that is the first mention we have of a phoenix. Okay, so that's what, maybe 2,700 years old, end of the Bronze Age. Yeah, exactly right. And after Hesiod, we have to jump forward about 300 years to Herodotus, who's an Iron Age writer. He writes about having seen a phoenix in what we would now uh, call ancient Egypt. <laughs> Classic Herodotus, <laughs> the, uh, in quotes, father of history. <laughs> yeah, mate, phoenixes, they definitely exist, because I've seen one. <laughs> Just like I've seen the giants of Northern Europe sparring with griffins over their hordes of treasure. Just don't visit Persia, old pal. Or I wouldn't if I was you. There's ants there, the size of foxes. They eat camels and poop nuggets of pure gold. (laughs) I mean, that's Herodotus, isn't it? it? It is. Uh, He was a spinner of yarns, I guess we could call him. (laughs) And, you know, there's no evidence that Herodotus ever visited half the places he wrote about, including Egypt or Babylon, which he famously describes as having city walls that contain 100 gates, each 100 metres high, all made of shimmering, shining bronze. So, you know, he's not what you'd call a reliable source. No, indeed. (laughs) But what does he actually say about phoenixes? Uh, Other than he's spent some time with them. (laughs) Yeah. So he says that phoenixes fly to Egypt from Arabia, bringing their parent birds plastered over in a nest of myrrh to the Temple of the Sun, so the Temple of Ra, and that they bury their bodies of their parents there. But interestingly, the phoenix is not known to come back to life at this point in time. It's just a slightly strange funeral rite. Well, that's curious. So where does the coming back to life bit actually enter into the mythology? Well, we do have records in ancient Egyptian texts of a bird god called the Bennu, or simply Bennu, who was part of the creation of the universe. And records of Bennu date from the pyramid texts, which are the oldest ancient Egyptian funerary texts in existence. How old are they then? They're over 4,000 years old. What? Yeah. Uh, They were inscribed into the walls and sarcophagi at the pyramids in Saqqara, as excavated in the 1880s. And they give an account of the creation of the world with this god, Bennu, who later became the soul of Ra, who flew over the black waters of Nun, the kind of primordial abyss the ancient Egyptians believed predated existence. And Bennu also known as he who came into being by himself, brought light to noon, prompting a lotus flower to grow, which then became Ra. Wow, that's a bit mad. I love Mm. it. So what's the term? He who came into being by himself. That sounds quite phoenixy. It does, doesn't it? And Benno, this bird of light, was said to be able to continually give birth to itself like the ever-renewing light of the sun. So the ancient Egyptians had this mythical bird yeah. and then ancient Greeks like Hesiod and Herodotus kind of took on that folklore and span it into something else. In uh, uh, Herodotus's yeah. case, a good pub anecdote. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, that's kind of our best guess as to where they got the idea, but nobody really knows. And where do the Phoenicians come in? Because I've, I've heard that that yeah. term. Is that something to do with the phoenix? Well, the Phoenicians were an ancient Semitic people who grew to prominence after the Bronze Age collapse. The name seems to have been given to them later, with cities ruled by them, including Carthage, Tyre and Byblos. They actually called themselves Canaanites and grew in power due to their developments in boat building and navigation. So where does their connection to the phoenix come in, or doesn't it? Well, the word comes from ancient Semitic, the language that eventually became Hebrew, with 
Phoenix meaning red coloured. Oh, so they're not named after the bird, just no. sort, of the sort of flaming, fiery colour. Yeah, that's right. The Phoenicians seem to have dyed their clothes and ship sails with madder, this kind of purple-red dye. And so the bird was seemingly named later after the colour by ancient Greek writers. Oh, OK. So you get these later classical writers who mention the phoenix, including third century scribes like Pliny the Elder and Ezekiel the Poet. But what's really interesting about them is they all disagree about what the phoenix looks like. Excellent. So what kind of accounts do we get? (laughs) Well, some people say it looks like a heron. Some that it looks like a rooster. Others say it's multicoloured like a peacock. Others, that it's yellow and red, or that it has eyes that are blue as sapphires and talons that are the colour of roses. But my favourite is from Lactentius, who says that it's a songbird with a head of fire that's bigger than an ostrich. That's outstanding. Can you imagine? <laughs> Ostriches are huge. Yeah. <laughs> Still, check it back to Pliny the Elder. Well, he's always good for a laugh. Yep. How does he describe the phoenix? Uh, he says it's as large as an eagle, and has a gleam of gold around its neck, and all the rest of it is purple, but the tail blue, picked out with rose-coloured feathers, and the throat picked out with tufts and a feathered crest adorning its head. Wow, that sounds fabulous. What a gorgeous-sounding creature. (laughs) Purple, blue and rose, Mm. and nothing at all like a domesticated turkey. (laughs) Well, indeed. Um, (laughs) But where things really start to heat up for the phoenix is actually after Christianity has started rocking and rolling, for perhaps obvious reasons, if you think about it. Ah, I'd never thought about that before, but is it basically used as a metaphor for Christ rising ding, again? Ding, ding. Yeah, mm. Christ and, to a certain degree, every Christian soul. So even in Egyptian texts, by the 4th century, you get things like this, and I'm quoting from a Gnostic manuscript here. A soul-endowed living creature called phoenix kills itself and brings itself back to life as a witness to the judgment against them who did wrong to adam and his race unto the consummation of the age blimey that sounds a bit serious yeah well it does and it's possibly not as romantic as you might expect similarly from the 11th century exeter book this compendium of early english poetry we have this bird's nature is much like to the chosen servants of christ pointeth out to men how they, bright joy through the Father's aid in this perilous time, may under heaven possess, and exalted happiness in the celestial country may again. Well, that's a very tangled sentence, (laughs) and probably better in Old English, but I get the gist. We should look to the phoenix as a symbol of eternal life. Yeah, exactly. Hmm, I feel like maybe this is spoiling phoenixes a little bit, (laughs) because in my mind the phoenix is this beautiful bird associated with exoticism and magic, And from the sounds of it, scraps of early legend were kind of co-opted to become about judgment and ascent to heaven. Yeah, well, there's actually a technical term for it in philosophy, which is metempsychosis, the transmigration of the soul. Well, that's a really old idea, Mm, isn't it? It's found in Orphic religions as well as in Christianity. But still, it's a lot less dreamy when you think about the symbol of the phoenix being used by the church for hundreds of years. Yeah, sorry to burst a bubble, but... Well, I mean, that's basically the gist of how the phoenix grew in the public consciousness. And it's not just the Christians who co-opt the legend for this idea of renewal. For example, the Romans used the phoenix as a metaphor for Rome itself, with the idea that though Rome may crumble, the purity of the idea will rise again. A notion that's never, ever been misused by a nationalist demagogue or tyrant in the years since, has it? (laughs) Well, and your pal, Billy Shakes, and his chum, John Fletcher, in their Mm. play Henry VIII, also used the phoenix as a metaphor for Elizabeth I, writing of her, Nor shall this peace sleep with her, but as when the bird of wonder dies, the maiden phoenix, her ashes new create another heir, as great in admiration as herself. So shall she leave her blessedness to one, when heaven shall call her from this cloud of darkness, who from the sacred ashes of her honour shall star-like rise, as great in fame as she was, and so stand fixed. 
Yeah, Shakespeare and Fletcher there really bigging up James I, who, <laughs> let's be honest, was one of the most profligate kings in British history. Yeah, well, he certainly prided himself on his plumage, <laughs> he did. didn't he? Purple and sapphire and rose-coloured well, indeed. Well, yes. <laughs> and nationalism and propaganda aside, Shakespeare did use phoenixes quite a yeah. bit, including in his not very good poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle. Yeah, not, not his best. But still, I, uh, I take your point and I can see that basically from the dawn of the Christian age, the phoenix kind of becomes this handy metaphor for spiritual purity, eternal life and resurrection. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then during the Victorian era and into the Edwardian era, where there's this boom in what we might today call fantasy fiction, the phoenix pops up everywhere from Christian writers like Yeats and C.S. Lewis to any number of comic books and video games and so on. Yeah, the X-Men, of course, yeah, the of Phoenix course, isn't yeah. there. Are there other birds like the phoenix in other cultures? Oh, for sure. For example, in the Hebrew Bible, you have the kol, C-H-O-L in English, the sand bird. In Slavic mythology, you have the zavtitsa, the fire bird, whose magical mm. feathers burn bright enough to light up rooms and which are the subject of loads of fairy tales. I love the fire bird tales. Yeah. Ivan Sarovich and the grey wolf, great fairy tales. Yeah, so and, good. And in Hinduism, there's, of course, the garuda, the sun bird and king of all birds, enemy of all snakes and the naga especially. And in Persian myth, you also have the Simurgh, the ancient mythical bird with the body of a peacock, the head of a dog and the claws of a lion. Yeah, but none of these birds or gods are quite the phoenix, are they? Nah. For example, they're not necessarily fire birds mm. and the parthenogenetic aspect isn't part of their mythology. No, that's very true. But there is connecting tissue. For example, the Simurgh is said to live 1,700 years before plunging itself into flames to die, similar to the Arabian myths of the Anka, this incredibly beautiful bird that lives in the sun, who again lives for 1,700 years, lays eggs every 500 years, but the Anka brings calamity when it appears and is huge, only living on a diet of, and check this, elephants <laughs> and fish as large as whales. Wow, I mean, the residents of Sesame Street thought they had a big bird. <laughs> Now, the closest analogue has to be the Conrul of Turkic and Mongol mythology, which again is gigantic enough to carry off elephants. It also appears as a peacock with the head of a dog and the claws of a lion and sometimes has a human face. It also hates snakes and its feathers are the colour of copper, but the Conrul is famous for being able to both carry souls out of the netherworld and of being reborn out of Flames. See, all these different mythological birds are making me wonder if the phoenix is actually the original. Because mm. it seems to me like maybe there are loads of mythological creatures which existed in legends all across well, what we now call the Silk Road, yeah. which ran from China all the way to Europe and East Africa for well over a millennia. And the Chinese have their own mythical firebird called the Feng Huan, which is also an enemy to snakes, also born out of the sun. Those legends are said to be about 8,000 years old with carvings of the Feng Huan found in tombs from this time in the Kunlun Mountains. The Feng Huan is said to have the beak of a rooster, the face of a swallow, the forehead of a fowl, the neck of a snake, the breast of a goose, the back of a tortoise, the hindquarters of a stag and the tail of a fish. Not only does that not sound very phoenix no. but shopping for clothes must be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, quite right. But in China today, the Feng Huan is known as a phoenix, with the bird said to be able to fly to heaven and back and to have purifying powers. Like forks in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Yes, a bit like forks in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. All this does make me wonder, of course, as to whether there really were these legendary firebirds in the past mm. and words and stories of them travelled all throughout the ancient trade routes, kind of mutating into the version of the phoenix we have today. I mean, if there is only one, it would be very difficult to see or find it. So I'm going to hold out hope that somewhere there still is a phoenix and that it's continuing to reproduce itself over and over again for all of 
time. Well, thank you, Martin. That was very interesting. My pleasure. And although we'll be taking a bit of a break from our regular programming schedule for October, between series two and three, while we release a load of spooky stories and ghoulish delights during our first ever haunting season, the Three Ravens Bestiary will return during season three. And we'll be back on Monday, of course, with an all new episode all about the historic county of Northumberland. Of course, if you would like to support the show and access tons more Three Ravens content, including all of our episodes ad-free, our stories as text versions, exclusive episodes like today's Mega Mabon Autumn Equinox special, <laughs> and episodes of the Three Ravens Film Club and our monthly newsletter, which is packed with folky goodness, do consider joining our Patreon for just $3 a month or $6 a month at patreon.com forward slash Three Ravens Podcast. Please also join us on social media at facebook.com forward slash Three Ravens Podcast, Instagram. Instagram at Three Ravens Podcast and on Twitter via Three Ravens Pod. And if you can, please write us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or drop some stars wherever you get your podcast. In the meantime, then, while our mythical beast has flown out that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle till you're out of the woods. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour. And our logo is by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, written and produced by me, Martin Fox. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean men, with a down, derry, derry, derry.